Our first presenter is our MC of the day as well, Dr. David Eagleman. He has one of the most unique minds in the world, and he's right here in Houston, Texas. A neuroscientist at Baylor College of Medicine, a best-selling author, both fiction and nonfiction, an adventurer, self-described possibilian, and we'll let him talk about that later, a very close friend. Please welcome Dr. David Eagleman. So say I were to offer you $100 right now, or I were to offer you $110, but I wouldn't give it to you now, I'd give it to you in one week. So what's your choice? By a show of hands, who's going to take the $100 right now? Okay, and who's going to take the $110 in a week? Okay. So I'm going to change it a little bit. So let's say I'm going to offer you $100 a year from now, or $110 53 weeks from now. Now who's going to take the $100 in 52 weeks? And who's going to take the $110 in 53 weeks? OK. There's been a huge preference reversal here. Now everyone's taking the $110, but what I want to point out is these two choices are identical. In both cases, if you wait seven extra days, you get 10 more bucks. There's no difference between the choices, right? So how come everybody switched? Well, the reason is because of what economists call discounting the future. What that means is that rewards that are in the future, that are far away, have less value to you. So this is what's called a discounting curve. It's showing the perceived value of $100 as you're thinking about when you would receive it. Would you get it in a week from now, a month from now, a year from now? It turns out it loses value pretty quickly into the future. Now, the interesting part is rewards that are now or close to now are very valuable and they drop off quickly. Whereas rewards that are in the future kind of flatten out and there's not that much difference between things in the future. And this got economists thinking that maybe what's going on is it's like there are two processes happening here. One process that really cares about short-term reward and a separate process that cares about long-term reward. And that got neuroscientists thinking about the problem. So my colleagues Sam McClure and Jonathan Cohen a few years ago decided to do the following. They had volunteers do these sorts of something now or more later economic decisions while they were in the brain scanner. And what they discovered was something incredible. They discovered that there were essentially two separate brain systems for short and long-term decision making. So they found that there were certain areas that became active when people chose the short-term immediate reward. And these are the same brain areas that are involved in emotion and impulse control and drug addiction. And on the other hand, they found a completely separate network of areas that became active when people chose the long-term reward. And it turns out that the more active these systems became, the more, the better that people were able to defer their gratification for the long term. So what this means is you have two separate systems in the brain for short and long term that are battling it out with one another. So what this means is when you're at a party and the hostess presses chocolate cake upon you, part of you wants that sugar and that delicious taste right away, and part of you says, no, don't eat it, you'll get fat. Right? And you're arguing with yourself. This is why you can argue with yourself and get mad at yourself and cajole yourself because you have different systems under the hood that are fighting it out. The thing is, they've only got a single output channel of behavior. There's only one thing you can do. You can either put your hand up or you can put your hand out. And that's it. The problem is, the short-term systems are very powerful. Right? I'm assuming that everybody in the audience uh, would, would like to be fit and healthy and so on, and yet you'll still eat the chocolate cake when it's put in front of you. Because it's very easy to get seduced by the short term. Small rewards sooner almost always win out over larger rewards later. And this is because things that are more distant in the future, like um, you know, being physically fit, those have a hard time exerting much emotional power on you, whereas something that's right in your face exerts a lot of force on you. So this is why we end up getting seduced by the short term. <clears throat> now, I think that understanding these issues about what's going on under the hood in the brain can help us understand larger social issues, like what happened in the 2005 housing bubble burst. So at this time, what happened was 80% of the, of the mortgages that had been recently lent um, 
were, were adjustable rate mortgages. And at about this time, what happened is the subprime borrowers who had taken these suddenly found their interest rates going up, and they couldn't pay that, and they couldn't get refinanced. So delinquencies soared, and credit tightened, and the economy started to melt down. Now, what does this have to do with the brain? Well, it turns out that these adjustable rate mortgages are perfectly optimized to plug in to the I want it now circuitry in the brain, right? It's this, it's this you know, take, take the house now, live better than you thought you could, impress your friends and family. At some point, the interest rate will go up, but that's very distantly in the future, hidden in the mists of the future. So by plugging directly into this instant gratification circuitry, what happened is these lenders were able to almost tank the economy. So I believe that housing bubble bursts are actually a neural phenomenon. And if we want to understand these better and prevent these in the future, what we need to do is continue to study the machinery of the brain. OK, so when you start looking around for these I want it now types of deals, you start seeing them everywhere. So for example, consider, consider athletes who will take anabolic steroids even though they know that it will shave years off of their life. It's easy to take the short term in deference to the long term. Um, I recently met a man who had, when he was a college student, he had accepted $500 to donate his body when he dies. So they gave him an ankle tattoo, and when he dies, at some point in the future, that will tell the hospital where to deliver the body. Now, there's nothing wrong with with donating your body to science. But what you can see is that it's a really sweet deal, right? Because $500 now feels amazing, whereas death is inconceivably distant. So it's easy to take these sorts of deals. And what struck me as interesting about it was his situation had exactly the same structure as an archetype that we have in, in myth, which is the deal with the devil, right? You take fame and glory now in exchange for your soul in the future. And you can see why it's very easy to accept these deals, because things that are not in front of you, things that are very distant, get, get discounted into the future. They have, they're, they're, they have less emotional impact on you and your decision making. OK, so we see that it's easy to get seduced by the short term. And so the question is, is there any way that we can manage this aspect of ourselves? Well, people have come up with some kind of interesting structures. So in 1909, there was a man named Merkel Landis who was a treasurer at his bank in Pennsylvania. And he went on a long walk, and he came up with a new financial idea. He came up with an idea, and he thought, I'm going to call this a Christmas club. And the idea is that my patrons, I'll see if they will give me their money all throughout the year. And that way, the bank will have money to profit from and invest. It'll have capital to work with. And I'll hold on to it all year, and I'll charge them an early withdrawal fee if they take their money back. And, and that way, uh, just before the end of the year, just in time for holiday uh, shopping, I will give them their money back, and then all year we'll have this, this capital to invest. But would it work? So he tried it, and it worked like gangbusters. So that year, 400 patient, uh, uh, patrons in his bank socked away an average of $28 each, which was a lot of money in the, in the early 1900s. And immediately, other banks started competing for this holiday nest egg business. It caught on like wildfire. What blew away Landis is that people wanted to give him their money all year. OK, well, why did they want to give their money? After all, if they held on to their own capital, then they could for sure get a higher interest rate somewhere else or they could invest in emerging opportunities, right? But instead, they were giving him their money with restriction fees and early withdrawal fees. OK, well, the answer is obvious. They wanted him to stop them from spending their money during the year. They knew that if they had the money, they were going to blow it. OK, in the same way, a lot of people use the internal revenue system as a kind of Christmas club. So by claiming fewer deductions on your paycheck, you have the IRS hold on to your money, and then you get a big check in April, and you feel great. It's like free money. But it's not free money. It's your money, and you've just had the government holding on to it, and they get to earn interest on your capital in, instead of you. Nonetheless, this is actually a good move for people who, who intuit that if they've got their money, they're going to spend it. What they're doing is they're granting responsibility to somebody else to protect them from themselves. 
Okay, so I have a framework to explain this strange human behavior. And in order to explain this framework, I have to step back three millennia to the king of Ithaca and the hero of the Trojan War, Ulysses. So Ulysses was on a protracted sea voyage returning from the Trojan War to his home island of Ithaca when he realized that he had a rare opportunity in front of him. He was going to be passing by the island of Sirenum Scopuli, where the beautiful sirens would sing melodies so beautiful that they beggared the human mind. And the problem with the siren song was that sailors were so entranced with these beautiful melodies that they would steer their rocks towards the ship. Uh, they would steer their ship towards the rocks and they would crash. Okay. So Odysseus knew that he was as susceptible to the siren songs as any other man. So what he did is he came up with a plan to deal with his future self. Not the present rational Ulysses, but the future crazed short-term decision-making Ulysses. So what he did is he had his men lash him to the mast with ropes, and he had them fill their ears with beeswax so they wouldn't be able to hear the songs. And he told them, no matter what I do, do not listen to my entreaties. Keep going until we are past, well past the sirens. Because he correctly surmised that he would be screaming and yelling and cursing and trying to get the men to steer towards the rocks, and he knew that the future Ulysses would be in no position to make good decisions. So in other words, the Ulysses of sound mind wanted to structure things in such a way that the future Ulysses wouldn't do the wrong thing. It was a deal struck between the present and the future Ulysses. Okay, this sort of freely made decision that binds us in the future is what we call a Ulysses contract. And a Ulysses contract, this, this concept, can immediately explain the, the enduring success of the Christmas club, for example. What, what the bank patrons are doing is they're lashing themselves to the mast at the beginning of the year so that their summertime selves don't listen to the siren songs of commercialism and blow all their money so that by the time they get to December, they're broke. Right? It's the same concept. And, and when you start looking around, you see Ulysses contracts everywhere. So, so let's return to the chocolate cake. So it's actually not as simple as saying, okay, well, I've got my short-term sugar craving and my long-term diet plan. It's actually more interestingly complicated than that because what people do is they say, okay, you know what? I'll eat the chocolate cake, but I will promise my spouse that I will go to the gym tomorrow. And by doing that, they're setting up a Ulysses contract because they know that their future self might feel tired and lazy tomorrow, and so they're binding themselves in a contract here. Okay. So, what we've seen so far is that there's a lot of seduction with short-term decision-making, and if you want to do the right thing, what you need to do is bind yourself into a contract. Because otherwise, it's not going to happen, right? So take your New Year's resolutions. These never last past January. Why? Because voluntary controls simply aren't enough. If they were, we'd all be fit and thin, right? But it's just, it's not enough to make yourself a promise with good intentions and good resolution. Instead, what you need to do is, at the moment when you're full of resolve and commitment, that's when you need to think about carefully structuring a contract to bind your future behavior. So what I'd like to do is suggest three actionable steps for setting up a Ulysses contract uh, with yourself. These are ways that you can get there effectively. So one of them is you have to minimize temptations. So for people who are alcoholics who are trying to break their habit, the first thing to do is you get rid of all the alcohol in the house, right? Because if you have any there, it's going to be too much of a temptation when you come home from a stressful work day. And by the same token, if you're trying to quit smoking, you don't go places where you know that other smokers are going to be hanging out. And people who have problems with impulsive spending will sometimes set up these budgets that disperse only small amounts of pocket money so that they don't have a lot of money that can seduce them into impulsive spending. So that's number one. Number two is put money on the line because the prospect of losing money hurts a lot. Right? So, so here's an example of a new kind of diet plan. This is a website called Stick K. And here's what you do. You go to the site and you say, you know what? I want to lose 10 pounds by this date. And you give $100 to the company. 
Then, if you have lost the weight by that time, you get the money back. It's an honor system. And if you have failed to lose the weight by that time, they keep the money. The reason this works is because as you get closer to your commitment date, your emotional systems kick into gear, and you really care about losing that money. So essentially what you've done is your present self gives away the money so that your future self has to work hard to earn it back. And according to their website, they've got $5 million in contracts on the line right now. So this is a very effective way to set up a Ulysses contract with yourself. Actionable step number three is recruit social embarrassment. So, so here's a question. Why would anybody sign up for one of these fitness boot camps? Have you guys heard of these things? The answer is, it's because somebody knows that they want to lose weight, but they know that their future self might be a little bit lazy or tired. And when you sign up for one of these fitness boot camps, if you don't show up, the whole group jogs to your house and does sit-ups and push-ups on your lawn and yells at you until you come out. Well, that's a terrific idea. A, a calmer version of this idea is just to pick a workout buddy, because that way, when you feel like not going to the gym, you have to make an excuse to somebody that you like and respect, and this is a way of binding yourself into the contract of going to the gym. Okay, I'd like to make one more point about what is perhaps the most pervasive and maybe underappreciated form of a Ulysses contract, and this is when you commit yourself to a meaningful deadline where things are really at stake. Because when you're doing that, what you're saying is, okay, my future self might be feeling tired or lazy or uninspired about something, but I'm going to put him in a situation now where there's really stuff on the line, whether that's money or my job or my social reputation. I'm going to commit right now to some future date and tie myself in there. Now, I can illustrate two points by pointing out something that happened uh, just recently. In December of last year, President Obama made a public announcement where he said, we are going to draw down all our troops from Afghanistan in 18 months. So at that time, I wrote a piece in the New York Times uh, suggesting that this announcement meant two different things to the administration and to the nation. So to the administration, what it meant was by putting a big flag on the calendar and saying in 18 months, we're going to remove all our troops from Afghanistan. By doing that, Obama was lashing himself to the mast. He was saying, I, I want protection against the unknown siren songs of the coming year and a half because nations, like people, are, are constantly buffeted in the winds of short-term events. So this is a way of, of, that a president has of making sure that a nation sticks to the plan. To the nation, it was a little bit different, this announcement, because it turns out that 18 months is essentially the same as 18 years when you're hearing an announcement of this sort because of future discounting. People don't know how to think about 18 months. It's too long to set up a deadline with that sort of time scale. So the right way to structure something to have emotional impact is to identify and adhere to a bunch of intermediate goals. That's the way to do it because nobody knows how to think about 18 months, but everybody can value month-by-month -month action. So you have to structure deadlines carefully. And this is the same lesson when you're setting up your own Ulysses contract. You don't want to have um, one massive deadline at the end. What you want to have instead is several small goals that you can hit. Somebody uh, was interviewing Michael Jordan, the basketball player, and said, how do, you, how do you mentally prepare yourself to go in there and score 32 points each game? And he said, well, I, I can't think about that, that's too much, but I can think about scoring eight points per quarter. That's manageable. Okay. So, when you leave here today from the UP experience, you are going to be full of ideas and commitment and resolve to go out and do something. And what I'd like to ask you to do is really think about how you are going to set up an unbreakable contract with yourself to follow through. Because given everything that we know about conflicting neural systems and the seduction of the short term, it's clear that having good intentions is not sufficient to change the world. So how are you going to lash yourself to the mast? Thank you very much.
David, before I hand the show over to you, I've got one question for you. you. You study so many different things, and today's topic is somewhat of a slant on time perception, is it not? Can you speak a little bit to the things that you do in time perception? And from an adventurer's perspective, I'll tell the audience that this guy has fallen from how far? How many? Feet? 150 feet. 150 feet free fall just to study what that feels like and whether or not there's a time differential. So <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, time perception is one of the main things that I study in my laboratory. Um, it's, you know, we spend a lot of time studying the other senses like vision and hearing and so on. But, but time is something that is metasensory. It lives on top of the other senses, and it's quite understudied. Um, there is a relationship to this because that future discounting comes about for a lot of reasons. The, the question is, why do we value things less in the future? And, um, you know, it's because things in the future are more uncertain and so on. But there's another issue that I'm studying right now, which is that it actually costs to represent information through time. So if I ask you to hold something in your head for five minutes or 10 minutes or a month, that costs neural energy. You're having to keep it online right. and actually burn neural energy. And that's part of why we prefer to have things now so that we can take that thing offline. Because it actually burns energy, which is why if you spend a whole day thinking, like today, you're gonna be hungry at the end of the day because you're burning a lot of calories neurally. Um, so I think that's the place where the study of time and this issue of future discounting come together is in how we represent things through time. So those people that have their web access that have signed up to lose weight and have donated are already losing weight right while we're listening <laughs> right. to all this. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Ernie. Have a great show. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thanks.